talk is meant not to give uh, specifics. It's meant to raise some thoughts in your mind when you're dealing with hand fractures. So there are some thoughts that can come to my mind and some of it is from making many, many, many errors in my life that some wisdom has come in. My first task would be to thank uh, uh, Dr. B.B. Joshi for taking me under his wing and tolerating me for nine years because it was, it was uh, one of the worst students he might have had. Uh, but thanks to him, he opened uh, a lot of windows for me for thinking and, uh, and for excelling. It was Dr. Tarapuwala who sowed the seed. Actually, I was his hand registrar. And it, it was indeed a, a great pleasure being his hand registrar for two years at JJ Hospital. And then, of course, when I was with Dr. Lad, he, he, he became the president of the ISSH. And quite surprisingly, I had the great honor of working with three past presidents of the ISSH during my formative years. <clears throat> There's no co conflict of interest in this talk. And with the permission of uh, Nilesh and the moderators, I'm leaving out mallet finger and jersey finger injuries because to me, they represent tendon injuries. I'm also keeping out of my talk uh, avulsion injuries with ligament avulsions. So I'm going to stick to breaking bones rather than pulling out of bones. <clears throat> I'm trying to divide this into four parts. So we look at fractures of the hand, we assess them and conserve them. Then we look at diaphyseal fractures. We look at a large, for a, for a, la a large period of a, a chunk of this talk would be directed towards intra-articular fractures. And then we'll also look at open fractures. Uh, I don't think we'll have time for malunions. <clears throat> Each of these sections would be followed by a small discussion with the moderators and a brief uh, brief answers to queries that may come up. So please keep asking your questions as you get them in your mind so that Dr. Jagannath and uh, Dr. Tahir can then uh, bring those up during those discussion periods in between. And this idea came from Dr. Jagannath and thank you very much. I don't like to drone for 90 minutes at a stretch. Uh, <clears throat> so let's start with conservative treatment. And fractures, the, the thing is, as time goes on, we keep learning new things. And as we keep learning new things, we want to implement them. Once you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail and you feel like tonking it once with a hammer. So if you have a new technique, you learn something new, you want to use that. Therefore, lots of procedures come in and go out. So what remains is the bedrock. And the bedrock is the basic. So conservative treatment, continues to remain the bedrock of hand fracture treatment. 45, 50, 60 percent of the fractures that present to me even today in my consulting are conserved. So we need to understand the role, the science, the art, and the great satisfaction of treating these fractures uh, conservatively. The first thing to understand is obviously we are all, many of us are hand surgeons, many of us deal with hand injuries. We know that they're not trivial they matter a lot to the patient. They're not to be simply strapped or splinted and left for somebody junior or the ward boy to complete. I believe that hand fractures are a measure of your intellect and skill. And if you can get a good result in every single hand fracture that comes to you, that puts you above a lot of others because simply because of the measure of intellect and skill required for hand <clears throat> fractures. So therefore, I treat them as a challenge. And I want to always succeed in every challenge that I face. <clears throat> so the first thing is to have a practical assessment of what we're dealing with. So look at the fracture on the x-ray, see which bone is involved, where is that bone involved, whether it involves the intra or extra articular uh, fracture, whether it's displaced or undisplaced. Then you look at it whether uh, there is any displacement, whether it is of a particular type, which means transverse, oblique, spiral, involving the joint, etc. Where in that bone does it lie? And if you take one, one word from each bracket and then describe the fracture, you have an idea of the character of the fracture which you're dealing with. So it could be a closed, minimally displaced, 
transverse or oblique fracture of the neck or the shaft of so and so phalanx or so and so finger. So you've got a complete description rather than just saying there's a hand fracture. When you see these fractures, you need to decide whether you're going to treat them with uh, a splint. If they are stable, you can treat them with a splint or plaster or strapping. If they're unstable, you need to reduce them. Once you reduce them, they may get converted to become stable. You can then go back to that splinting, plastering, or strapping. And if it's not stable, and if it's unstable, then you need to think in terms of fixation. And when you think in terms of fixation, you think whether you want to do it internally or externally. So this is a very general way of looking at it. And it all comes out at uh, the most important part of this being understanding stability of a fracture. If it's stable, you can conserve it. So what is stable then? Well, what is stable for me is something that I read long, long, long ago. And that is if a fracture, fractured finger is capable of 50% of painless active range of movement in the joint before and after the fracture, if there is sufficient stability in, mobility, in motion, and if there's no malrotation during that motion, this fracture can be taken up for conservative treatment. Such a brilliant, small, simple way of thinking whether I should treat this conservatively or not. And if this is possible, you've already uh, understood a bit of what I'm trying to get across today. So let's take a look at some examples. That looks like a tough fracture because it doesn't look like a simple fracture. There seems to be extensions into the diaphysis and there seems to be a small air gap, as I call it, in the fracture or when you look at the left side of the screen. On the right side, you see it's a rotated fracture. So when you look at the finger clinically, so don't only look at the X-ray. When you look at the clinical presentation, you see that when he tries to flex, there's scissory. So if you want to assess this, you need to look at the nails end on. And if you look at the nails end on, you see the ring finger is tilted. When you ask him to flex, they're scissoring. <clears throat> Similarly, when you look at the X-ray, if you look at the, at the X-ray on the right, you can see the middle finger joints are stacked up one on top of the other absolutely nicely, whereas the one on the left, that's the index finger, you can see is not stacked up properly. So therefore, there's rotation there. You need to derotate this. And in children, the periosteal sleeve, this is a child, and the periosteal sleeve is usually very strong and it's going to hold the fracture stable enough for you to splint it and continue to mobilize this. So here's a fracture, and I've been showing these slides for many, many years, and I think it makes sense to me when I look at this. Should I fix this one or not? 100% I want to fix this one because it's displaced. I see a spike in the flex tendon. If I add the clinical picture, that he's 72 years old, this is a non-dominant hand, that he's an uncontrolled diabetic who has Parkinsonism and is on blood thinners. Now that changes everything. Can I now go back to the, 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 the small algorithm that I showed, reduce and reassess? I hitched it under local anesthesia, hitched perfectly well, now aligned, stacked up joints, an excellent function. So what looked like a sure shot surgical case need not be until you've done this so don't make the decision before seeing the whole picture the next thing is when you treat conservatively understand one thing that you cannot treat them by neglecting them you cannot just do something what you remember that you need to give a ball bandage anything that is round can be pushed in you should not put the ball in there, you can't start physiotherapy when the fracture is healing, you can't press that ball. And a ball bandage is a completely difficult thing to treat. If you look at this one, where the MP joints remain in extension, here, of course, the MP joint is in flexion, but if you're going to tape it down with dynaplast, oh, that's going to give you a lot of trouble. Don't splint it with crazy splints like this and don't compress the limb because you see the balloon that's happening, you're going to cause so much stiffness in the adjacent fingers. It's not a joke that the patient will have to go through five to six months of therapy after that. There are more ways of destroying the hand for a very simple fracture. Look at all this. This is not to be done. Don't buy off splints and do this. What do you need to do? In the old days, from Dr. B.B. Yoshi, we learned the functional position of the hand. 
beautiful absolutely fantastic a little difficult in this day and age patients may not accept it but it's wonderful this phase two pass was something that bailed us out many times we also used for a long time actual traction using the goose neck splints that was in vogue then and that of course is a high profile splint and difficult to manage so how do you strap these fingers you strap them in the segments not covering the joint using paper tape with cotton in between so it's very important that you do this and after that once you body tape you check the range of movements and <clears throat> after which you use a gamji to pad the functional the finger and the hand in the functional position and give a plaster slab from the dorsum and this plaster slab should hold the functional position so even for a simple small fracture this is exactly what i do for all of them in the first phase for the first four five days now here's a patient who has angulation has been corrected put into a similar slab like that the index and middle fingers have been left open so he can use those but the others are in a functional position and strapped and buddy strapped so that he can move and obviously he's going to get a good result so you have to take it from one step to the other now this is another patient whom i would think there's no question the soft tissue interposition and i might have to do surgery so i can counsel the patient but he refuses intervention and we somehow hitch it and splint it and he can get a good result a fair result in that so even in those difficult ones where it's comminuted and completely rotated you can get a good result what about these the boxes fracture so always there's this worry that you know too much of angulation 30 degrees 35 degrees the cmc joint of the little finger can take this and that and there's lots of theory but here's the patient no lag can extend his little finger and can make a complete fist conservative treatment so you need to get them functionally moving don't keep in the mp joint an extension for long they're going to cause problems you cannot correct this angulation of a comminuted fracture with just a simple plaster holding it in extension so accept that so you start with the functional position and you'll be able to correct it what about these they look like they need to be fixed and put back into place but what if the patient doesn't want it so hitch it back into place and you can get good results so conservative treatment works and it works well it's only that we are not patient enough so <clears throat> Why should any of these fractures then be operated? There's a simple reason. One is, of course, you can get them out of a plaster or a splint much earlier and they can start moving and they can start using the hand. So that's one of the best advantages of operative treatment. The other is obviously that uh, you, 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 you do not want to put them through large, difficult to manage plasters and bandages. So there's a question that uh, often arises and can intra-articular fractures be conserved? Yes, of course, some of them can. And we'll discuss some of these a little later. 